Run it up, then run it back. Yeah. Run it up, then run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Good Monday morning and welcome to Run It Back. We are back here in Los Angeles, bright and early. Well, the three of us are in Los Angeles. We've got Evan Turner and Eddie Gonzalez. My name's Michelle Beadle. But we've also got Shams, who could not possibly be missing out on a morning like this when we've got all this great basketball to talk about and teams going to their conference finals. But thanks, Ja. Uh, Shams, what's the latest with Ja Morant? John Ryan has been suspended essentially indefinitely uh, from all team activities this offseason from the Grizzlies. Uh, there, there's an NBA investigation that's, that's commenced now. He was seen holding a gun in an Instagram Live video over the weekend. And this is the second time in three months that this has happened. The first time came in Denver in March. He was intoxicated. This one was really looked like to be in the middle of the day. And when Adam Silver met with John Morant in March, he told John Morant, this cannot happen again. He, he was convinced. He got a pretty assured John Morant that, that he <laughs> understood exactly what he, what he did and he would be better from it. But clearly, two months later, he does the same action again. And there were no laws broken in, in, in March. There was, didn't appear to be any laws broken the other day. But from, from, from the standpoint of breaking morality with the league, it's going to be conduct detrimental to the league, and there is concern. There's definitely a fear around the Grizzlies, even internally, that this is going to result in a pretty serious suspension for John Wright. The investigation does show that the gun was his, and this did occur in the recent days. It's detrimental to the team. It's also stupid to humanity. You could count it as that as well. Um, your, your reaction, woke up, woke up yesterday, saw this, and went, I mean, it's just definitely cringeworthy. <laughs> I mean, after, you know, a couple months ago, it was super tough. Uh, you know, everything that occurred with the team, you know, the position you're in, um, you were really scared for the player as well. You know, he made a huge mistake, of course, and then to, you know, kind of replicate that is something you never want to see. You know, you, you never want to occur, and you kind of just like, yo, the decision making and, uh, you know, the position you're in, you're a role model. You know, a great player in the future league and your organization, you know, it's just, it's a tough situation to be in. You hate to see it. And, you know, as a former NBA player, you know, I hate to see one of your brothers go through this. But there's going to have to be some uh, accountability and, you know, obviously, you know, some act right. Yeah, I mean, look, he's broken no laws as best we know. We, sure. We, he's the right to bear arms and all this great stuff. But clearly whatever happened in March or whatever it was, didn't matter. He didn't care about mm -mm. any repercussions. He sat on the podium just a few weeks back and said, hey, yeah, looking back, my situation definitely hurt my team. And then he does it again. So he doesn't, he doesn't care about that or he's, maybe he does and he just can't get right. I don't know what's going on. But the point is, whatever happened last time changed nothing. And he's not more conscious of it. He's not more understanding of that. He, he's not thinking of the big picture of his Nike deal, his At Grizzlies all. deal. <coughs> he doesn't NBA. care about none no. of that. Uh -uh. And so, like, I think in a vacuum, hey, having a gun, not a big deal. Getting on Instagram with it, kind of dumb, but not right. a big deal. But the fact that he didn't learn anything <laughs> throughout this and is here we are back again. There's a game summer, game seven yesterday with the MVP, uh, the GOAT. Beat the you know his longtime rival a few days before that the the reigning MVP before that he won a series the other day and we start off talking about John Morant because it's just that idiotic and so well a lot of people had grace for him last time hey we don't know what he's going through but yeah. all this stuff. don't have it this time because now we do know does and he, he just doesn't care yeah. does he know how stupid he looks like it's it's one thing to like you want to love guns man i don't care that's that's on you be responsible about it though and it's not about legality it's it's who you are and what you represent and you have different rules that's just the way life yeah. is you have different rules because of the opportunity you've been given in life but it's like he's 12 and pretending he's in a music video and i i don't it's <laughs> pathetic looking it doesn't look cool at all i don't know who it's for yeah now nah, I, I think at a certain point i think he's going through a lot of points where he need to be mature <laughs> I think at every point in league, you go from being a cute little kid to being, <laughs> you know what I mean? To being a cute little kid, to being a rookie, to, you know, crossing over and comprehending you're the vet and the leader of a franchise. So the little stuff that you used to do, the stuff that you used to get away with, you no longer can do it because now they're looking for you to carry a whole city. At one point, a whole, a whole you know, organization, a whole 
corporation, the NBA. Yeah. He's one of the faces of it. And when it's coming down to that, I think he really has to lock in, turn a corner, and be the ones, you know, giving out the conversation, taking a Damian Lillard type lead or taking a Steph type lead where you're, you're, you're accountable and you take ownership of every environment that you're in because you're really that big of a figure in the world that's looking to you to what you're going to do. So, you know, he's, he's a role model. Everything he does is going to set the tone. But, you know, the bigger you get, the more unreal it all gets. And he has to comprehend that. <laughs> It's frustrating, yeah. Shams. Are we expecting more? I mean, is there any limit to what he could be punished with, is what I'm, I guess, trying to say? Could it be a long time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Adam Silver has, is going to have full jurisdiction. Now, I think there's this thought of full season. Gilbert Arena's got essentially a full year ban. But for him, he, he brought gu guns to the arena. Uh, they were out. They were displayed. It was on team property. This happened in the off season. So if, you, if you're looking at presidents, this did occur in the offseason, and he did get eight games last time for a similar incident. He's, if, if this is his gun, it, or if he did display it, this happened the other day, and the investigation all proves that, you would expect a more serious suspension. I don't know if they go the full year, whether it's twice as many, whether it's in the 20s, 30s. I think that's all stuff that people around the league are talking about. But, guys, even more crazy is this, is, is he's him and his group – Clearly, they're showing and displaying his actions to the public. This isn't like this is being leaked to the media, that this is some video that I've gotten a hold of and I'm putting out. This is, they're going out of their way to, to showcase it. And so I, I do think it, it does show a pattern of behavior for John Morant, for his inner circle, and they're going to need to be hard conversations beyond any suspension, I think, this summer for John Morant. And whatever training that occurred before, either didn't work or, or maybe he's going to need more from the league and, and we'll see what comes down in the coming weeks. I mean, I always did laugh at the idea that he was going to rehab for what nobody ever was able to tell us. We weren't sure, but how crappy are his friends? Like, how, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> I mean, it's tough. I, I think uh, as, as a, you know, individual, you really look at your friends and your environment to, you know, the same goes you're going to be as successful as your five closest friends. And I think, uh, you know, as a unit, it takes a community to really, you know, push yourself ahead and, you know, really stay focused. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's terrible to really, you know, if he goes back and look on this and be like, yo, we messed this up. I think, um, you, you know, your environment and people you hang out with, you got to comprehend it takes, it takes a village and this isn't just his responsibility, it's everybody's. So much money, Eddie. <laughs> so much money, Ja. What are you doing? You're the you're one of the faces of a league, not just your own team. You slap him on the wrist like that, you're all complicit at that point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and that's how I feel looking back at whatever happened. He, he served eight games, came back, got right back into the playoffs. Really, New too. Nike rollout. Really, yeah, too. That's true. Rollout. Really, too. Yeah. And nothing. Nothing changed. There's zero consequences zero. to that besides sitting down for an interview and lying, essentially. <laughs> and, yeah, that's what you get. You slap somebody on the wrist, they might touch the cookie again, and, and, and they won't care. Here's what we're not going to do, wrap him in hugs and thoughts and prayers. We're not going to do that this time. <laughs> this time it's on you, dude, and you need to figure out what's wrong with your life and, and keep it moving. Thank God we're done with it, though. We can stop talking about John Moran, <laughs> because I'm with Eddie. There's so much more to talk about. We'll start with this. Oh, dear. Uh, Celtics just crushed. Crush the Sixers. Tatum, oh my goodness. 112, 188. They move on to the, or 88. They move on to the Eastern Conference Finals. 51 points is most in game seven in NBA history. MB finished with 15 and eight. Um, but Jason Tatum, he's one of those guys where sometimes you're like, what happened? This was not that day for him, Evan. He was perfect. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> like... Unbelievable. I mean, he started off on a mission. You saw the first play, one of the first plays of the game, he came out, got a two hand dunk. I mean, you know, last couple of games, you, you hear about his offense the whole time. They're talking about the first quarters, how many times he's missed so many shots in the first quarters, the streak and everything like that. This is the same guy that got three 50-point games in the span of a month. He's a walking bucket. Like I told you before, he's a, one of the best players in the world. He said it before. He went out and proved it. Just two <laughs> weeks ago, humbly, humbly. <laughs> two weeks ago, you know, the golden child, uh, Steph Curry, the one we all love, he, he broke the record for most points in his, uh, game seven. Tatum falls it back up. I think he, uh, this is going to foreshadow a lot. I think he's coming for the championship and, uh, you know, blast off into a different space. I, I talked to him yesterday. He said, I'm happy the record's back with one of the bros. <laughs> Kevin had 48. <laughs> Steph broke his record, got 50. Now he has 51 a week <laughs> later. Uh, his game five was, was impactful to me because yeah. he started, I believe, one and nine. 
He could not buy a bucket, but he was rebounding. He was finding ways. He was defending. He was he was getting his teammates involved. They kept that game close. Yeah. And I said I said on Twitter after that, that's like superstar stuff. Yeah. He eventually got some buckets laid in. And they ended up losing, but it was like that was the beginning of a turnaround. Yeah. And then the same thing happened in game six. He started rough. He ended up having a massive fourth quarter, keeping their series alive. And then and, and then game seven, he does what he does. And I told him, I said, yo, I knew the shots would eventually fall. You were so impactful in the game that eventually when they feel when they failed, something like this is gonna happen. And that's how great he is yeah. to be able to shoot through that, to get through that, to continue to find ways to help your team. And then when you need him most, home court, that's why home court matters. Yeah. He does that. Literally a historic performance. It was incredible to watch. I'm happy for, for Jason Taylor and the Celtics. Now, I definitely agree with you. Like, his all-around game, we're so used to him, you know, having crazy offensive nights. But each game, he's been getting 12, 13 rebounds, yeah. dominating, moving the ball all around, six, seven assists. And, you know, even on his off nights, he's getting 25 points, 12 rebounds, yeah. six, seven assists. <laughs> like, what, what are we... And he, he hasn't he just started finding stroke again. So think about what's gonna happen next series and coming out in that situation. I think we're I got mm. the Celtics winning. I got Jimmy the Celtics Butler, winning. Uh, Jason Tatum. I Jim, like it. I like it a lot too. I, I, I like it. this a lot. Look, this this game got ugly. I mean, it was the first half, you're just like, okay, something and then I I, I don't understand yeah. what happened. But as you can imagine, um I, I wanna ask Shams how he thinks they were able to contain that guy and the other guy in B. What happened, Shams? Offensively, they just look totally out of sorts. And I think one thing that was interesting that Philly went away from is that pick and roll with James Harden and Joel Embiid. That pocket pass that's been available throughout these playoffs that's made those two guys the most dynamic duo possibly in the pick and roll in the league, it really went away. And what you saw is the Celtics were conceding the corners. It hurt them earlier in the series when P.J. Tucker uh, guys got going from three-point range, but they tested the Philly shooters and they just were not able to make shots. Uh, down the stretch of these games, especially as the game went on. And Philadelphia really lost this game in the second quarter. And so as the pick and roll was eliminated, you can see the corners. You saw James Harden time and time again. He drove passes to the corner. He took what the defense gave him. And the Sixers just did not find any way to adjust their game plan offensively. They, they, they were totally out of sorts. Um, as you can imagine, Philly fans are handling this uh, very well. Um, <laughs> they're on Twitter calling this a classic Philly choke job. Do you agree, or did the better team just win? I think the better team just won. To be really? I, I honestly think well, so. <laughs> I think I, I'm just historically. I feel like the Celtics have always had their way with the Sixers. Mm. I think uh, you know. I think the two best players on the Celtics outmatched the two best players on the Sixers, in my opinion. As great as Joel Embiid is, I just think Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are at that level. And then we sit there as well, historically, not to knock him, James Harden has never been great in game seven, like, ever. So when you sit there, you get that going versus a couple guys that have been in tons of game sevens and had that experience and, you know, have a championship taste in their mouth, it doesn't shock me. And, and like I said, I think uh, the best team won, and I think it could have been done in six. But could you argue the choke job started in game six? I mean, if you really wanted yes, to be a Philly... Yes. Hater, I guess. Yeah, they had them. Like. They had them on the ropes in Philly. You got to finish that series. Yeah. Well. You, you you know your team. You, you, Doc Rivers has lost the most game sevens yeah. of all time. He's yeah. lost three one before it was yeah. fashionable multiple times. He's lost three two <laughs> multiple times, including now. Well, this hurts. Uh, he's lost game sevens of the finals. It's it's a tough reputation to have. James, as you mentioned, similar thing. And you look on the other side. Jason Taylor's rookie year. He's playing game seven with LeBron James. Like, he's been doing this since yeah. he got in the league. Jalen Brown, same thing. Yeah. They've been playing and making deep playoff runs since they got in the league. I believe I seen the, the stat yesterday. Jalen Brown has the most game sevens ever before the age of 26, yeah. and Jason Tatum has the most game sevens ever before the age of 25. So they do, yeah. they do this. <laughs> they're used yeah, to this, yeah, yeah. and they're used to doing it on their court. They stepped up when it mattered most. Uh, James Harden, only, only 3 of 11 yesterday. They didn't even score 10 points. Come on, man. Only two free throws. Yeah. What is that? This game was tied 55 55. I know. Yeah, like, how, how does so that what happened? Yeah, no disrespect to James, but how does that happen? 3 4 11 in a game seven elimination, and that's your reputation? And, and, that's, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's type crazy. I seen a stat yesterday. Eddie, you could get 10 points. I know it. I uh, know you could get 10 I points. I tried, I couldn't, <laughs> but, but you probably could. <laughs> I, 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 I seen a stat yesterday, the 33 to 10 third quarter, which is where the game was decided. They, they, that's, a, that's a 23 point difference. They lost by 24. Uh, it was the most lopsided quarter in a game seven since 1997. 
This is how historically bad that quarter was. Yeah. You have the MVP, you have James Harden, one of the greatest scorers of all time. You can't score 11 points in a must win game in a quarter. In a quarter. You deserve to lose. I think it is a choke job. I think it's there's gonna be massive changes. I mean, mm -hmm. Shams would know better than us, but you gotta feel, figure Doc Rivers is on the way out of town. Oh, there's we'll get rumors to that. about where James yep. Harden may be playing next. It's a lot going on in Philly right now after that. Yeah, it's, it's the deja vu part of the end of a Philly season coming up next. But Embiid, <laughs> um, look, Embiid, very emotional roller coaster for him in this playoffs because you win the MVP, you get to accept it in front of your fans, and then here he is after last night's game. I can't win alone. I can't. Me and James, we just can't win alone. You know, that's why basketball is played 5-on-5. Five five. So, you know, we just need everybody to just, you know, try to keep finding ways to get better and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be fine. My ears are going. Did he say me and James? Hmm. Uh, James? What's he talking about? Are you just being a friend or what? I am. I mean, <laughs> they, supposed, they, they might be taking vacation together <laughs> what after the is he year. Talking or about? He's, he's still thinking about the MVP, watch he got him. <laughs> but I will say it's about like the franchise players. Like, I know you say you can't win alone, but you get like 90% of the salary. You shoot 90% of the rock. <laughs> and at the end of the day, like, I said it before, it's not about the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmy's and Joe's. When we get to that <laughs> point, you carry us over the top. So it's crazy. When it comes down to it, they try to blame everybody else. Not saying it was so malicious, but it's like, no, it's on James and it's on Joel and B. Yesterday, Jalen, Jalen and Jason carried them to a game seven title over two of the top offensive players in the league and blew them out by 30. So what was the difference between their greatness and your greatness? I love Embiid, but that kind of felt not cool. Yeah, at all. I, I've seen people say the quote had more context and all this stuff, and he's, he's, he takes some accountability. He shot 5 of 18 yesterday. Yeah. Come on. He, he had 15 points, eight rebounds. Yeah. He was outmatched in every way by Jason Tatum, by Jalen Brown, kind of by Malcolm Brogdon. <laughs> P.J. Tucker hit a couple threes for them. He stepped yeah. up when he did. Tobias Harris had 19 points, had a great Come game, on. hit right. some big shots. And to get up there and say, y'all lost, not me, yeah. Right. That that was kind of crazy and, and look, you, help us out with the 55, bro. Like yeah. help or, or with like, the 51 points out there, help us out. Like what do you? Or Jimmy Jimmy Bucks is in South Beach, not tripping that he lost Tyler Hero, <laughs> not tripping that Kyle Lowry's getting older, not tripping. Yeah, you know I mean that you know he got Co Zeller playing at a certain level. Like no, <laughs> overcome it, call it a day, and, and win. You're the, well, you said you got two of the best offensive players in the history of the game. You're in the locker room scrolling through your phone. And your MVP, he's on the podium saying that. Oof. Yeah. I'm, that hurts. Yeah, I'll be in Bermuda. Bermuda. Good luck, yeah, Joe. It's, it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, that hurts. Especially because you, you name drop James Harden and you're kind of like, well, that's not quite accurate now. No, I would have just tweeted and be like, bro, I've been averaging seven points for the past three years. So the <laughs> fact that my name is brought up or like, we talk about PJ Tucker, like, yeah. Y'all let PJ Tucker play 30 minutes a game. And not score. Like, that's not the reason. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you got MVP when it's just you and James. So, it is what it is. I mean, they'll bounce back. It's a learning point. 27% from the floor last night for Joel Embiid. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you can't win it alone like that. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, as sure as the sun will come up today, it's now time to talk about Doc Rivers and the safety of his job. Six for the last 22 in potential closeout games. It, it just, this is what we do at the end of seasons, right? So how, this time, this time, once again, should they move on? I don't, it's so, it's so hard to really say that because when you deal with this team, this team isn't like a regular NBA team. This is a superstar team and only certain personalities can really handle it. And then it's like, who else is up in the chambers to really help that out? Obviously you see Monty Williams, he's free right now, but you're not so much coaching, you're, you're more so managing personalities. And, you know, trying to keep, you know, the, the, the wheels moving. I, I feel as though when, you're, when you comprehend dealing with superstars that have, you know, that make so much money, they're global icons, global figures, and every rap song, like, they're moving how they want to move. So I think it's all about how you deal with the stars more so than, you know, if, if it's an X and O thing. Sometimes you might have all the right answers, and they just might not like you, and they'll just get you fired. So who, who, who could you bring in next that you think will really keep their attention and change the culture? But... I, I think sometimes it's about, you know, is it a doc thing or is it an organizational thing? You know, because ding, ding, ding. You, look at, you look at Ben Simmons, he's posting from yesterday. <laughs> like, oh, he's, he's dead, not, didn't he? Yeah, he's not accountable either. Like, you understand what I'm saying? It's like we're looking at so much of the players, uh, the people in, in the front office, maybe so much as how the players are and how the you know, culture is and how the leaders really set the tone for it.
Yeah, Doc Rivers is an interesting situation. I don't want to make it sound like I think I know more basketball than Doc Rivers. He's forgotten more basketball than I've yeah. learned. He's, he's played a great yeah. career. He's won championships and all that. But to, when you watch this happen over and over again, when you watch these fallouts over and over again, they have the collages of the, the important games they've lost the Sixers. It, look, he didn't have Joel go out there and miss all those shots. He didn't have James look lethargic. He didn't have a... But so, somebody's head will roll. And, and it, when you see somebody like Joel say some stuff like that, he said after the game, you wonder what the hell's going on in that locker room. Doc doesn't have the most sterling reputation amongst players around the league. Even his son is kind of like hated playing with him yeah. too. Um, that could be a, an Austin thing. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. I, I think he's going to go, and I think it does turn into what Evan said, like who's available. You know, it, it, Nick Nurse, do we want Budenholzer? Is my, we want Monty Williams? It's on and on and on, are there viable candidates? And I think they also need to figure out what the future of this team is in general. Is James Harden going to be there? Well, there you is go. Is Joel Embiid happy? Is he going to be a guy who's going to eventually want out? On and on and on. They have the Tobias Harris contract they've been trying to get rid of for years and years and years. They're going to have to pay Tyrese Maxey eventually. They now have P.J. Tucker, who has a player option for year three, who you best believe he's picking that yeah, up. Yeah, no, rock P.J. <laughs> they're they're P. tied <laughs> up. Live, live. And... and when they brought in Daryl Morey, it was always a sign like, hey, eventually Daryl Morey is going to want his own coach, whoever that is. So when you bring in your president after you bring in your coach, that's always a bad sign for the coach. Mm. And uh, I'd expect him to be out. But well, we've don't expected know where it they, before. Yeah, I yeah. don't know where they go from there, though. Yeah, they, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's like the next question is when do you end, I guess, the process, quote, unquote. You don't get rid of MB, but... That's right. The this is... It, I, last time they made it or advanced this far or where they were at was 2012. And that was when myself, Iguodala, yep. Drew Holiday were on a team. Ever since then, they redid the process, tried to jump, jump loaded, jump started, and everything like that. And they only made it to the second week. Again. Ever since Guys. then. And they spent $100 bajillion since then. So it's either it's facts. blow it up. Or just, you know what I'm saying? Just new restart. process. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Fine. I don't want to. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I'm starting to not trust the process. Uh-uh. No, I didn't. Process didn't look <laughs> that great. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think it's great. Yeah, working. when I was there and they were starting the process, I'm like, damn, is this really worth it? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the process you know isn't working out. You end up with out. Jalil Ogre for Ooh, two years. And exactly. Ten years down the road, all you have to show for it is Joel Embiid, and you got just as far as you guys got. No, that's so. Well, that's what did sad. we do? That, yeah, I mean, well, you paid, you, you spent a billion in salary, basically. Yeah. But shout or to Joel. Or a hundred bajillion is what I, I prefer. You go back spend to that. It all. Like, okay. like that. Um, look, part of the uh, ends of seasons are the firings of coaches. Uh, in this particular case, it's Bonnie Williams. Just by the way, they they lose Game Six to the Nuggets, but just as a reminder. Did take the team to the 21 finals, was coach of the year in 2022. Now he's without a gig. Shams, the dismissal of Monty Williams, what, was it just as simple as game six? Well, I'm told this was unequivocally a organizational decision from ownership to management, top to bottom. I think when you look at it, Monty Williams, four years there, uh, they made it to the NBA finals, got to the second round a couple times, and you have to give Monty Williams a lot of credit for the culture that he established there and what he's done the last four years turning them from the bottom dwelling teams of the league to being a team that's highly, highly competitive. But this is a team that's trying to compete for championships. And anytime there's an ownership change, Matt Ishbia is now the owner. Uh, this, that's just the business, business of basketball. There's new ownership. Uh, there's a championship level focus now. Matt Ishbia, James Jones. I expect them to be very aggressive in the marketplace to go find a new a new program builder, someone that they know, someone that they trust, someone that they want to turn the keys to that can have respect, accountability with the players, um, have offensive creativity. I think those are all going to be prerogatives for the Suns in their next head coach. And this is, this is an ownership that is pretty resourceful. They're eating three years and $21 million mm. on Monty Williams' contract. Mm. So I, I think it's obvious. They're fine going out there and spending a lot of money uh, this is a destination job with Kevin Durant, Devin Brooker locked in for the long term. Couple names I would look at pretty strongly here. Tyron Liu, head coach of the Clippers. He's the, the Suns' number one target from what I'm told. It all just depends on how uh, Ty Liu's conversations go with the Clippers in the aftermath of this disappointing season in LA and the potential of him signing a contract ex extension with the Clippers. Where do those conversations go this week? I, I think they will ramp up even more. And another guy to keep an eye on, Nick Nurse, former coach of the Raptors, one coach of the year, won a championship in Toronto. Uh, I would expect them to ultimately interview six to seven candidates 
for this open position? Um, God, that's the Tylee one's interesting because you've got two superstars in LA, but they're never available. Then you move over here with two superstars who seem to be more available. Um, but new owner, a coach that guys seem to like, how risky of a move is this? It's really risky, especially not knowing the market for coaches. And I, I would think one of the coaches mm. who wanted, he just signed with the Houston Rockets, Ime Odoka, and that that was never available to you. Another coach you want, Tyron Lue, he's on the team now. So it's either going to cost you draft picks now, Oof. or if he resigns and then signs it to you, and then the NBA investigates and whatever, they, it might cost you draft picks later when they, when they penalize you. Uh, but it's tough. And you, you look at the job market, who is the right coach for this team? What even is this team? They have a ton <laughs> of questions to answer this, this offseason, but I think Shams is right. It's a destination that people in the league love. Everybody yeah. loves Arizona. Uh, you got two mega stars on that team, and even though they flamed out just now, it's enticing for a coach to go, what can I do with KD and Devin Booker and a blank slate? So, I mean, they'll be at it for a while, I'd imagine. And, uh, you know, somebody's going to land a good gig, but they're going to have a ton of pressure when they get out there because it's championship or bust for that team and that owner right now. I think, too, as well, uh, we're bringing up everybody in regards to, like, Tyron Lue, but a blank slate. I believe Steve Ballmer's going to come with a blank check and keep Tyron <laughs> Lue. He's, he's, not, he's not letting that guy walk away. But I think it's a great job to have. You have uh, KD in the last few years of uh, in his prime along with Devin Booker. And I think if you get, you know, some more, you know, energy around there, some more defenders and, you know, a little bit more depth, you know, you'll be playing deep into playoffs every single year. And uh, the environment and the new energy is going to be great. Look, you guys know how I feel about getting paid to not work. I mean, three years, <laughs> $21 million, I'm in. I'm all in, sign me up. But Monty Williams might not want to just chill. Uh, he might want to go right back to work. Shams, what's the market for him outside of Phoenix? Yeah, I think he's, he is going to take time. Like you just said, Michelle, he's going to take time with his decision uh, after this firing. I'm told he's fully focused on his family. That's who his, his call was to first, was to, to his family member, uh, family members about him losing his job. And I think he's going to spend that time. But listen, the Bucks will pursue Monty Williams, from what I'm told, pretty aggressively. I think he's near or at the top of their list after they fired Mike Budenholzer. They're going through their own interview process as well. But... If he's, if, if he's ready to coach immediately, I think he's going to be at the top of their list. I think the Detroit Pistons will show a level of interest. Toronto Raptors. The Pistons are going through their own search. They just interviewed three finalists. But if you have a guy like Monty Williams available, you're, you're Tom Gores. You have to take a look at a guy like that if he wants to come and, and be on this upstart, rebuilding young organization and have a blank slate, you know, four or five year contract potentially. So... I, I do think there will be significant interest in Monty Williams in the marketplace. I love when this happens, like musical chairs, and then there's a new hot coach available, so he jumps up to the top of the list and everyone moves down. Um, but let's look at the, the roster itself, Eddie. So DeAndre Ayton, it's been just an up and down ride for him. Didn't seem to always maybe get along with his coach. Do you expect him to stay in Phoenix? I don't, and it's not because I have any information, but it's just team building exercise. This is the asset they can get the most for. We don't even know what his value is at this point, but they were willing to let him go last summer. <laughs> They've had issues with him before. It, it's 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 just leading down that road. Now, it's if they can find a market for him, what can you get mm. for him? What can you get for the nearly $30 million he'll make next season? That's how they're going to have to build this new roster. With the way he flamed out in the playoffs as well, it's not all a great sign. I just think he won't be because this is the best move they have available to them to make. Yeah, I agree. I think another thing as well, like uh, you see on the bench a couple of times, you see DeAndre, you know, historically getting into it with some of the players and everything. Yeah. But like I said, when you turn a corner and, uh, you know, every team has leaders. So when you're kind of stagnant with or not having miscommunications with Kevin Durant or Devin Booker, I think anything is going to be wavy or murky. So I think he might be in a, a position where he'll be somewhere where he'll be more happy as opposed to being there. I think you get something in return two or three pieces for less money that might go hard and play harder for a bigger goal because uh, clearly DeAndre wants to have his uh, own team. And mm. it's, just not, it's just not the space with uh, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker. And, you know, you can get a lot of, out of that position and people are going to help and, you know, 
it's put crazy. them in position to be a championship contender. That's it, the number one thing. It's a position that's massive in that conference yeah. as well. You look at what the Warriors do with Kevon Looney and his rebounding. Or even and back that, in the day, Clint Capella. Yeah. Like how, I mean, just in Houston. Yeah. Just step up and accept your role. Yeah. And it's like, uh, and then obviously you deal with Jokic, and then you deal with Anthony Davis, the two <laughs> uh, semifinalists right now. Uh, you have to have a great, <laughs> solid center out there, and it's it's frustrating. Has to be frustrating for the organization to say, "Yo, did Jock Landale outplay Ooh. our former number one overall right. pick in this series that we just lost?" And that's not great. You know, he's lucky Marvin Bagley got drafted number two in that draft right. because he's also the guy who was drafted ahead of Dre, Trey Young yep. and Luka Doncic. <laughs> And now look, a year into his second contract, we're talking about is he going to be traded from the team that picked him number one overall? And and it's not been a smooth road for any of it anyway. No. It's been. Does he even want to be here? Uh, CP3, still a starting point guard. I, I, I feel like I, I feel like he makes his own rules to be honest with you. So when it comes down to whether our thoughts are or not, he's starting. And I think. Uh, <laughs> To his credit, he knows a lot about basketball. I mean, he, he's a leader on the court. He's a floor general. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, he's an intricate part of whatever team he's on. So I just don't see – it took, like, two extra years for Steph Curry to make the All-Star game because of CP3. Mm. So <laughs> for him to lose his starting spot, I don't ever see that happening. So go get a Tony Romo type, type vibe. Could be somewhere where they let him start. <laughs> it's, that's they let true. him bring the ball up yeah. and do his his CP stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, look, he, this is, we're talking about a guy who literally changed the CBA in a way to benefit <laughs> him and make him more money. Brilliant. He's gonna go out his own way. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's in Phoenix or somewhere else, but he's gonna get his. He's gonna make sure of it. It's brilliant. Uh, taking a quick break here. When we come back, the Lakers blew out the Warriors. I will take a restroom break. Eddie will take over the show. <laughs> is the dynasty over or is it just on pause? When Run It Back returns. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, and run it back. So this <laughs> happened. Uh, Lakers advancing to the Western Conference Finals after beating the Warriors in six games, and that last game was disgusting. LeBron. 39 and 9, AD 17 and 20. But Austin Reeves, this is the world we live in. Austin Reeves with 25 points. It's like I have to believe. And they're making me, Evan. I don't know what to do right now. Uh, what'd you learn about the Lakers in this series? Man, I just learned it really tough, man. Obviously, <laughs> if you give them a chance to get confidence and everything like that, they're gonna have a chance to beat some of the best teams. And like once you see they beat the Warriors, everybody stepped up. I think everybody's pretty much engaged. When it comes comes down to Lonnie Walker the fourth, comes down to AD, how he stepped up, Austin Reeves, Dennis Schroeder. I think this team is engaged or together and they're looking to, you know, get to the finals. Yeah, I think the, the key for me is Anthony Davis fully embracing the role he's in. And he's this really weird star where he's probably not gonna take the most shots, probably not right. gonna have the most points, but he's gonna absolutely anchor a defense that can win a championship. He's gonna hit the boards. I feel like he's finally become the center yeah. he's supposed to have always been, <laughs> and it's absolutely transformed yeah. this team. You can't get into the lane against them. He's able to pressure the Warriors, the vaunted Warriors, and they're at the three-point line and give as many issues as he can. Look, he can't guard Stephen Curry at half court, but he can come off those screens, he can defend, he can, he can get a hand up, he can make it tough, and he did that all series long. He was the absolute key of the series, yes. and looking forward against the Nuggets, He's going to have to do it again in a much different way, but I think he's ready. And to me, that was the takeaway. And Austin Reeves being maybe the second most popular Laker of my life <laughs> because <laughs> I've been in the arena where he walks in and it's just like what? Kim Kardashian what? walks in, it's like, ooh. But Austin Reeves walks in, it's like, <gasps> What's happening? He's the man out there. <laughs> and the fact that he started slow in that series and managed to step up yeah. later in that series is actually huge for anybody who doesn't, who thinks this is like Lynn Sanity. Mm. The, the white boy version, uh, he's actually <laughs> stepping up in big games and making yeah. big plays. Uh, they're going to need him in the next series on both ends of the court, and I, I think these guys are ready. They, they look great. Austin Reeves. I don't know how many times I've said that during these plays. I just keep saying it like I've lost my mind. Uh, Shams, the, the big question, too, will be, and we're all sort of waiting to find out, is how much money is Austin Reeves earning for himself during this postseason? the biggest worry the Lakers have, I'm sure. And the more <laughs> this this postseason goes on, the more Austin Reeves gets on the court and plays. Come He's on. showing himself to be a top three, top four option 
on this team. And so the most the Lakers can offer outright is four years, a, a bit over $50 million. I think it's $53, $54 million that they can offer him. And I think at this point, that's got to be a lock. Uh, the question is, are they, is there going to be a player option at the end? But then if you're Austin Reeves, what can you get out in the marketplace? And I think more and more teams around the league, teams with cash rates, teams like Houston, San Antonio, you, you have to look at a guy like that because he's not, he's not old. He's not super young either. He's kind of that middle of the pack uh, age range guy that, that can still, is still young enough career wise, that can come in, fit among your group, be a veteran leader to an extent, but still grow and, and develop with your group. And I think there is a concern for sure if you've got, if you're the Lakers, that he's gonna get uh, po potentially an offer sheet, even, you know, way, way, way <laughs> higher than 50. That shot right there bro. killed me. That killed me. Wait, okay, so. I mean, he, we, we know, we've heard his interviews, we know how much he loves being a Laker. But how much of it of the Austin Reeves show is because of where he is right now and how much he, well he fits versus if he goes and makes a ton of money somewhere else and it's just not quite the same? Yeah, I think you use the Lindsay Sanity thing once again to, to that point. You know, it's way easier being a third yeah. a third option with AD and LeBron on the court. That's an understatement. You have to say that to, like, the umpteenth degree. And, um... <laughs> You know, right now, I think one thing that, that Austin understands as well is, you know, he's, he's killing as well because of the position he, he's in. Of course, you want to go and, you know, have your own team and everything like that, but you have to weigh the pros and the cons. And the understatement of not only playing with AD and LeBron, but the notoriety you get from being in L.A., mm -hmm. being in a huge market. Like, you can go to Orlando and go make a hundred bajillion dollars, and we're, I love that word, so, <laughs> but yes, you do. nobody may ever pay attention to you again. Right, we'll never hear from <laughs> like, you again. You understand what I'm saying? Or like the new shoe deals and everything that's coming along. So I think if Austin could, he should, you know, try to stay here and keep building what he can build. You know, it's, it's tough, right? Because he can be a $52 million Laker. He can be an $85 million Spur. And Why do you gotta a, keep sending him to San Antonio? Why are we doing this? I think I he'd mean, be great. I, I think didn't he's ask a pop for him. Type guy. I think he'd be incredible out there. No. But but yeah, I'm yeah. with. I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. I mean, if if, if all, I love Austin Reese to death. If he's just walking into the if that's yeah, your, is he gonna if, be the number one? That's your lead guard walking into a Hell building. No. Like that's when dudes rest. Imagine, oh damn. Imagine oh. that summer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like, Imagine that summer. Yeah. Victor Wembanyama, Austin Reed. Don't jinx Two me. superstars now in San Antonio. Superstar? Settle <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what words I'm, are we saying no, right I, now? No, I, hey, I love Austin Reed. Austin, I love you. Yo, I've grown to love him. Superstars? Come on now. He's a mega star. By the way. I'm with, Austin, I, I'm with Evan, though. <laughs> there is a lot to him being in L.A. Yeah. And there's a lot to be gained. I don't know if it's a $30 million difference that he can gain out here, but he has a signature sneaker. He's yeah. all over the place, right? Now. Yeah. He wins a title with this team. Ooh. He's all like, no, no joke. I, I say superstar is a joke, but he's another type of celebrity now if he wins a title with this team and has a great parade and all this stuff. Like, it matters to be that guy in L.A. He's a Kobe fan. Like, he's Look, been and I'm not TMZ, but city. Kim Kardashian, three Lakers games in a row? Why? Man, I don't want to. Why, y'all? 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 I'm just saying, like, all right, the, he could stay with $50 I'd be like, ask for a mansion and then no state tax. And then, and then that should be all right, right? Wait, are you saying he's going to go to Texas then? No, no, no. Just, I mean, in regards to staying Cali. Fit, he, Who are you asking that? for no state tax? They can't whoever, just bless you with that. Whoever's the, the big guy. <laughs> <is. laughs> 50 million or 80 million It's probably That's what he's looking at. That's a big chunk of cash yeah, yeah, yeah. difference. That's yes. a lot to ask. He came up as a Laker fan. He loves the Lakers. Nah. You love you $30 million? I don't love, love the Lakers? anything worth $30 million. No, not want... even my own family. I'm not, I'm not, no. $30 million is a lot of money. I'd play, I'm not giving that I'd up. play in Minnesota. <laughs> For thirty more. I'd million play in dollars. hell for thirty more million oh, no. dollars. I mean, <laughs> like, what are we talking about? Thirty million dollars. No, if he leaves, rock out, and leave, it's just gonna be a different vibe. It's I agree be with a that. Completely different energy. It'll and, be a much different and, thing. And and you're gonna see a different position different. where you go from being a third option or a fourth option to Drew Holiday starting on you the first night. This is the easiest NBA. Like, like, do you, like, do you understand what I'm saying? This is the easiest NBA basketball he's ever gonna play. Yes. That's it's next to LeBron and James and Anthony Davis. Absolutely. And he knows that. He absolutely knows. Yeah, so. It's going to be fun, actually. I, I can't believe I'm saying that, but the Austin Reeves, where is he going, is going to be kind of fun to watch. <laughs> Superstar. Um, I've been the, the biggest uh, thing since Dinwiddie. <laughs> since Dinwiddie. <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> Losing my mind. Um, the Warriors also going to have some decisions to make. There it is. Shams, uh, the where is everybody going starts now. What does this team do from here? 
Well, the, the thing with the Warriors is when Draymond Green and the punch happened in preseason, it was assumed that that was the beginning of the end for Draymond Green with the Warriors and, and that the dynasty and this group, as we know, it was going to split. But now we're at the end of the season. The Warriors still believe in Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Draymond Green. And Draymond Green, he's got a $27 million player option. But from what I'm told, the Warriors intend to engage in discussions on a multi-year deal with him whether that's via opt-in and extend, whether that's opt-out and a new contract in free agency in July, they want Draymond Green to be part of the next year, two years, three years potentially. Um, and Green will have multiple suitors, so he, he's going to have some level of leverage if he enters the marketplace. But he made it clear the other day he wants to retire with the Warriors. We'll see if that happens. But beyond that, they've got a, a very, very high tax bill uh, lined up for this next season. What do they do with Jordan Poole? Jonathan Kaminga. Uh, Jonathan Kaminga is a guy that number seven overall pick. He showed he can play, but he did not get much burn in, in the postseason. And I, I'm told <laughs> if, if he doesn't have a role moving forward, he could look for a new spot uh, and potentially a new home as well. And all of that, above all of that, is Bob Myers' future. Is he going to be the one that's even going to make these decisions for the Warriors this summer? We still don't know. I think he's going to take some time. I'm curious, Evan, from your perspective, would you run this back with these three guys or would you begin the process, even though Steph Curry's where he's at, <laughs> would you begin the process of tearing it down? Yeah, I would run it back with these three guys, I think, and go back to a situation where you surround those three guys with veterans. I think when you go back to the early success, even when you had like Sean Livingston, Andre Iguodala, Leandro Barbosa, and, you know, Clay, Steph, and Draymond were younger, that team was mostly comprised of veterans that understood a bigger picture. I think, you know, a lot of the energy and a lot of words that you hear coming from that camp is uh, the younger guys were upset that they didn't get as much uh, hmm. playing time as they wanted to. And, you know, people were worried about where their future were going, or was going and everything like that. But I think if you sit people around who don't have to worry so much about their future or contracts like Kaminga or even, you know, Jordan Poole trying to, uh, you know, carve out his niche as, you know, no, no longer a younger kid, but like a big money guy. I, I feel as so though there's too many narratives you had to approach. And number one narrative is winning and, uh, you know, riding out Steph and his core's uh, final years of uh, their prime. It's kind of a crazy, it's crazy that we're here with this team given all that they've given and what they've done. But yeah. the Jordan Poole thing I find interesting because he's the one that just signed the new deal and that's the one we're focusing on. What do you do with him? Yeah, you, you, you talk to people about the Warriors and around the Warriors, it's always been dueling timelines. Steph Curry's 35 years old, yeah. Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, they're, they're 33. And then you have Jordan Poole, who looks like the future of the franchise. You have Jonathan Kaminga, who you've drafted. You have Moses Moody, you, at the time you had James Weissman as well, yeah. former number right. two overall pick. So you have your future and your present at the same time. And it never quite meshed. Yeah. And you know how it is to be in a locker room with vets and we're not, and young guys, we're not listening to the same music. Yeah. We, we're like, these guys are married, they have kids, yeah. they're, they're, they're living entirely different lives. And, and, and the young guys, they're trying to get it. They're trying to get there and, and they're trying to get that money. They're trying to get to that place. So it's always an uneasy balance. And then when one of the old old high, old heads punches one of the young guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. Dude, we, you cannot overlook that when you talk about this season. Mm -mm. You cannot overlook that tension amongst the team all, all season long. And we watch Draymond try to get kicked out of games. We watch Draymond step on a guy's chest. We watch, you know, he's going at it with Dennis Schroeder. And just the energy that Draymond Green brings to that team. If you're Jonathan, if you're Jordan Poole, you're sitting there like, yo, I'm sick of this dude. Like, so, yes, there's an uneasiness. I personally am not so sure that you just sign up for this core going forward. It has a very specific team. They're long in the tooth. Klay Thompson did not have a great playoffs. Mm -mm. Uh, Draymond Green did not have a great playoffs himself either. And, and you're, you're going to invest into three, four more years of an undersized center who can't shoot, who only offers so much on offense, of a, a guard who isn't guarding like he used to. He, he can still shoot on the right nights. Of course, he's Clay Thompson, but yeah. Yeah. he averaged, you know, it, this is not, is this $40 million of Clay Thompson that we're going to get every year? There are tough questions to ask, and, and they do need to settle that up top. They do need to figure out if Bob Myers is going to be there. And I think at the end of the day, you got to talk to 30, and you got to ask him, like, yeah. do we go forward with this? Oof. I think he's going to say yes, but there's going to be some warts with that going forward. You think he's going to say yes? Steph is going to want his guys. That he I, I can't imagine him saying no. That's a tough position nah, nah, to be you're in, you're absolutely though. right. You're absolutely it was, that, that last series is just tough with some yeah, of the guys. Not, not cute. you got to get at least one 
couple pieces. I mean, to he come had back to in. break the game seven record to get past game one, uh, series one. So right. that's a tough place to be. Shams, we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye to you, but your spirit will live on in our next <laughs> segment because you have been reporting about Mark Jackson, and we are gonna talk about that when we come back. But thank you for today. We'll see you tomorrow, uh, and we'll be right back. Mark Jackson, what year am I living in? We love to talk about this. Uh, yeah, so here we go. Shams, the Bucks, interviewing former Golden State coach. That's former, former, former Golden State coach Mark Jackson um, for that head coaching job. Uh, look, that was that was a long time ago. He was a finalist for the King's job last year, allegedly. So, Evan, you like this idea? <laughs> <laughs> no, Why are you mean, laughing? <laughs> no, you just threw it to me right away. I'm like, damn, okay. Well, that's how a show works, Evan. Did you think somebody else right. was coming in? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get my thoughts together. Um, to be honest with you, when you bring up the Warriors, the one thing that I'm not mad at if he does get an interview, it's not terrible. One thing that we have to thank him for are the Splash Brothers. Mm. He started the Warriors. He started that whole, not saying he did it himself, but the confidence, the energy, trading off the rail right. Monte Ellis historically starting Clay Thompson getting his guys in there saying Steph Curry is the best shooter. I got the best two shooters of all time. He started a trend where we always have to appreciate it. But um, you know, it's a different, it's a different time, it's a different game. I think, you know. He wore they were still still wore suits back when he was coaching. That's, See that? Was, that's how long I, I ago it was. That. Yeah, I heard that. And that's like crazy. the iPhone 8 was out too. But still, <laughs> um, I'm a big and I'm a, I'm a big believer in just, you know, seeing if it'll work out or whatnot. You know, Mark Jackson has a lot of basketball knowledge. And when it comes to this situation, like I said, it's all about who's out there. Mm. And when you go to some of these situations with, you know, superstar players, sometimes it's not so much about the X's and O's, about how you, you know, you work with them and who they're willing to listen to, especially after this situation. That's big. Look, I, I'm sure he makes a ton for, is, for much for easier life. Yeah. yeah. Stay doing that. Yeah. You don't got to win, you don't got to lose. Yeah. Enjoy that, Mark. I get the competitive spirit, but... You get to sleep at night? This this job is probably going to somebody else. Let's be serious. <laughs> wow, Shams just got scooped by Eddie. I love this so much. We're taking a quick break. When we come back, it's a really quick break. And when we come back, it's a really quick... And then we're done. So just stick around. <laughs> That's the worst tease I've ever said out loud. Great <laughs> Oh, everybody loves us a sequel. The NBA script writers running back the entire bubble. Here it is in the East, Heat Celtics, in the West, Lakers Nuggets. Would this validate that bubble title for Los Angeles? And yes, it does need to be validated no, if you're I gonna ask yourself that. I definitely think so. When you talk to the guy, regardless if this validates or not, the guys in the bubble said if you won a championship, that was tough because it, because at the end of the day, it's the toughest part of staying focused and doing so. If you won a championship in there, it meant you really love basketball. So I'm going with the guys in the bubble. I've been getting cussed out about this circumstance for like a day straight on Twitter, which is the norm for That's me. That's good for you, buddy. Which is the norm. But <laughs> they're not the same teams. I think there's something like 10 players amongst mm. the four teams that are still there. Uh, I know a lot of key parts are. That's not bad, though. Uh, look, I, I always love to ask the players because you cannot convince me that hooping in an empty gym, no travel, literally at Disneyland, <laughs> is is harder than hooping game seven on the road, 20,000 screaming, you, Tell the bas backboard is shaking when you shoot free throws, and you just got off a, a, a six hour flight. You can't convince me, there's no, no way. No, you're absolutely right. I think there are certain people in the bubble that reap the benefits of not having that type of pressure. You're absolutely right. I think, because when it comes down to it, not saying I was great in pressure, but like I never really thought of it like that, but there's dudes that sit there and literally shake. And a 30 point player in a bubble probably was really a six point player in a bubble. And I'll say this, they all had the same thing. So nobody had an advantage per se, <laughs> but you, if the crowd was screaming at me and I was in an empty gym, there's two different Eddies in yeah. my mind. Oh, no, no, no. And, and, and I think that's where certain people say, like, all right, bro, like, certain people are acting a fool in a bubble. Acting a, a fool. <laughs> Love that. That's going to do it for us on a Monday. But we'll be back tomorrow and Wednesday, 10 Eastern. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back.